Live, brought to you from the Eternal Word Television Studios in Birmingham, Alabama. our church. This whole network is built on trust. The essence of evangelization is to tell everybody Jesus loves you. We are all called to be great saints. Don't miss the opportunity. It's so good to see you, family. And I see all of them here that are extended family. It's always good to see the people that you never see looking at that camera, you know, but here they are and, and there you are. Well, today I, we got deluged with phone calls and two dozen yellow roses that I would speak about purgatory. Um, I mean, you don't have to go through all that trouble, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought we would touch on the will of God. Because I don't think we understand. You know, we live in a society where people think there is no sin. And, and that's very bad because if there is no sin, you don't feel a need for a savior. And then you wouldn't believe in purgatory. And you know, if you don't believe in purgatory, it, that's the most consoling thing. Everybody's afraid of purgatory. And some people think, I'm aiming for purgatory. Now that's stupid. You know, you want to aim for purgatory, you may end up somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you aim for heaven. But purgatory is a hard doctrine for many people, and it is a part of the deposit of faith. So if you're a Catholic, you have to believe in purgatory because that's a part of our faith. You say, why? Okay, let's imagine that somebody is dead drunk. You got that? Somebody dead drunk? You ever see anybody dead drunk? Okay. And they're on drugs besides. And they're so out of it, they fall in a gutter and they just fall out. And the truck comes out, doesn't see him, hits him, bingo, he's dead. You really think that that individual is going straight to heaven? Who thinks that? Nobody, see? You know that the weakness is there when he died, the sin, the condition is there when he died, and you know he didn't even have a chance. Now when he saw God, he saw the Lord. He may have been extremely repentant, that little area between death and, and judgment. We say, well, that's very hard. Well, don't you want to know it now? Do you want to be surprised? And say, I wish somebody would have told me. And you say, well, why is that just? Well, let's look at it another way. Here's a woman. She has accustomed herself to grave and grievous sin. She's a prostitute. She's had abortions. And beside that, she likes the whole thing. I mean, she enjoys her life. And somebody puts her in a cloister community where she's got to pray four or five hours a day. How do you think she's got to feel? Ah! That's what she's got to feel. <laughs> 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 
she goes, say, let me out of here, let me out of here. Does that mean she's damn no? She has a custom herself. She's become accustomed to this way of life. And she, in her heart, at some point, may have said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I didn't know. I didn't know. The good news is that if she really thought from her heart and she didn't know, and she had total repentance and total pure act of love for God, she could go up right off the bat. That's the mercy of God. Chance is a little nil. But what happened if she came out and she thought, now, why didn't I like to pray? There has to be something wrong with me. You see, grace starting to work, see? The Lord's after her, really is. Eventually, she'll be ready to face God and praise Him for all eternity. Now, you have to know that in order to arrive at that state from where she is, something has to happen, doesn't it? See? she got to do there what she did not do here. And so that is why there's an absolute necessity for a beautiful place called purgatory. Now, I'd like to bring the catechism out and tell you what it's all about. When you have a doubt, there's the book. And if somebody tells you it's too deep for you, that's hogwash. Because they just want you to read their book. But this is the book. So, it says, all who die in God's grace and friendship but still imperfectly purified. Isn't at this moment, would you say that you can think of somebody right now you'd like to hit smack on the head? <laughs> no? Yeah, there you go, see? <laughs> Okay, if you take that person now that you want to hear smack on the head and you die and he, all of a sudden, the first one you meet in heaven is him. Do you think you're ready? <laughs> huh? Okay, how would you act if that was the first guy you saw was him and you were in an imperfect state? You'd say, how did you get here? That would not be real love, would it? So something already happened to him to change him. Now something's got to happen to you for perfect healing. Is that not true? You see, doesn't that make sense? Purgatory makes sense. You know, if you fell in a mud pebble and you got up, you're still full of mud. Now, what happened if you didn't have time to change your suit or whatever, and you just walked around and you'd say, well, I can't help it, folks. I got kind of used to this muddy suit. <laughs> and I like it. Would everybody think there's something wrong with you? <laughs> You're walking around like you put it on and you never took it off again. You know, in today's society, you got to pay a lot of money for wrinkled clothes. <laughs> See, that to me is kind of wanting to be in purgatory and not wanting. They sell you at a high price clothes that have been squashed by some big machine and look like they're 20 years old. I saw a man with blue jeans on the other day and I said, boy, how long have you ever had those? He said, I just bought them. <laughs> I said, you just bought them. He said, yeah. He said, aren't they nice? I said, you mean you paid somebody to make them a mess the way they are? They look like bleach fell on them. There are a few little tears here and there. And I thought, now, don't we live in a strange world? See, even there indicates to me we know there's something wrong. We don't want to admit it, so we go by a pair of wrinkled trousers or wrinkled shirts or wrinkled anything. We, we know down deep in our heart 
I am not as kind as I used to be, or I'm not as kind at all. See, people don't understand anymore ordinary politeness. Ordinary politeness. I have never gone in a restaurant, especially when I'm traveling, that the men will sit down and the women have to pull their own seat. But before, a man would go out and he'd push the chair under her and, and then he would sit down. Today, you want to be equal? Put your own seat there. That's an attitude. And you see, we've lost that. And we've lost all those little beautiful things in life uh, that we, we've forgotten. Now, what purifies you in purgatory? It's not like hell. Uh, hell is a place of no hope. No hope. It's a place where you know you're going to be there forever, and you hate God with everything that's in you. That's, that's hell. Now, I know my liberal brothers out there say, there she goes again, preaching hell. Well, I hope you don't go there, but if you keep preaching there is no hell, you may. What a terrible way to find out there is a hell. Purgatory is like this, a little bit. Did you ever do something when you were a child and uh, all of a sudden you realized you disappointed your mother in, a, in the worst way? And although you're sorry, there's something in here that, that is a real pain that says, why did you do that? Why did you offend her? She'd been so good to you. She is your mother. And that's a special pain. Did, did you see, you, can you see where that's a special? You're already sorry you stole all those cookies, but you didn't know that we're for a bridge game, you see. So the people are coming in, and she goes, and it's empty. So you're sorry you put her in an embarrassing situation. So it's not so much you ate the cookies now, it's because you're sorry. Right? When you die, you're going to see Jesus like that, face to face. Face to face. You wouldn't visit the Queen of England with a dirty dress on, or your work clothes. No, you wouldn't even think about it. I'm always amazed how people travel today. Have you noticed that? When I was a kid, you traveled anyway. Even if you went to Akron, Ohio, which was 25 miles from where I lived, you dressed up. Now everybody comes in a plane and, I mean, they look pretty messed up. You know, they <laughs> You just wonder where they came from. You know? And so we, we, there's another thing, we don't have that kind of awareness, you know. So if I, if I went to visit anyone that was a queen or king, I would, I would do my very best to look right. Well, that's how it is a death. She, suddenly you see Jesus face to face. Number one, you realize how much he loved you. Ah. <gasps> That's gonna. That's what purgatory begins. See, you know. In here, how much he loved you all your life. How much attention he gave you. How many times you said no, 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 and more no. And how he forgave you over and over and over. And suddenly, you see someone you want to be with so bad, but you can't move. See, there's such a difference between him and you. And you really want to be purified. And so you go to purgatory. You go and you're happy there because you want to be so pure and holy and good so you can live with him forever. You're sorry for all your anger. You're sorry for the, the anger that was last for years and years and years and years. 
You're very sorry that you did not forgive. You can't go to heaven where all is love if you hate somebody. See, that doesn't make sense, does it, huh? And so what this good book is saying, you, are, you can be assured in heaven, in purgatory, you are assured of the, your eternal salvation. I've always thought when I die, I'm, the first thing going to hit my mind is, I made it. <laughs> I made it. <laughs> and you say, well, is it so hard? If you accept the will of God, it's not so hard, see. But sometimes, well, we're not too happy about what he does, see. Now, the souls, but let's go on here. It says here, after death, they undergo purification so that they can attain holiness. See, over here, every time you do some act of virtue, self-control, love, compassion, thoughtfulness, all of those kind of things, uh, you gain in the image of Jesus. You begin to look more and more like him. And then if we don't do these things, we look less and less like him, especially grievous sin. And say you don't take advantage of that awesome gift of confession where you can get bright and clean again. So we go kind of, all, that's how we go, just up and down, up and down. And what the church is saying is, in purgatory, you have the joy of knowing you're saved. You're saved. Now, it says here, as for certain lesser faults, we must believe that before the final judgment, there's a purifying fire. Now, let's look at the fire. Uh, would you say anger is a fire? Huh? I got a red spot in the back of my neck here. I was born with it. I'm glad nobody sees it. When that starts to get hot, <laughs> I say to myself, Angelica, Watch it. See, I know. I know at that point, if I don't do something, somebody is going to get it. See, that's my little thermometer. See, it's a little warning spot right here. Now, some of you have other warning spots. Your heart beats fast. You're ready. To <clears throat> but there comes a moment there when a little voice says, now, you know, calm down. This is your opportunity to be holy. Now, these are faults. You haven't done anything that bad yet. He who is truth says, whoever utters blasphemy against the Spirit will not be pardoned in this life or the next. Why is it when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Let's look at Peter and Judas, okay? Peter denied the Lord. Judas betrayed him. Judas felt in his heart, he despaired. He felt his crime was greater than the mercy of Jesus. And so he hung himself. So he died in grievous sin. Peter realized when Jesus looked at him as he was warming his hands in the fire, and his look was so loving and compassionate that he ran out and cried bitterly. Now, see, that's like judgment. That's that, that judgment when you die, you're going to look at Jesus. He's going to give you that awesome, loving, compassionate look. And right in front of you, it's going to, everything you ever did pass like that. And like Peter, you see, he realized what he did. So Peter had real repentance. Judas had regret. He got as far away from Jesus as he could get. But when Jesus appeared to Peter, especially at the Sea of Tiberias, he said, do you love me? 
more than these. And, and Peter said, you know I love you. And I, all of a sudden, he's changed. You see how he changed? See, Peter, when, when our Lord was said to the apostles, every, he said, all of these can deny you. I won't. Well, that was all over, and he did deny him. <sighs> he said, do you love me more than these? That's what Peter said he did. Now, Peter had to repair for what he said. He said now, this time, you see a change in Peter, don't you? You don't see a bravado man that's going to do something nobody else could do. What, did, what happened to Peter that he suddenly changed the look of Jesus? He felt so bad. You know, tradition tells us that Peter cried his whole life. And there were great furrows in his cheeks from tears he shed over the love of Jesus in his heart. Then Jesus asked him a second time, do you love me more than this? And he said, Lord, you know I love you. He wouldn't say yes. There was a change in Peter. And then when the Lord said the third time, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. Now, that's the purgatory of earth. There's not a person here or listening, in any country you're listening, that hasn't and isn't living purgatory right here and now. And everything is, is a kind of purgatory. I came here tonight, it's cold and damp. But I'm so used to the South now that anything uh, below a 60 is freezing, see? <laughs> I'm ready to go in the, in, the, in the monastery, shut the door, and forget it. But you go up north where I used to be, and all of you from up north, and you'd laugh me to, you'd laugh me to scorn. You'd say, what are you talking about? It's hot out there. <laughs> but that's my purgatory. When you live in community life, everybody has a different purgatory. I have sisters that are hot all the time. <laughs> Winter, summer, fall, and spring. <laughs> and I'm cold all the time. Winter, summer, fall, and spring. <laughs> so they put their conditioning up. I turn it down. <laughs> See, when they're gone, I turn it off. When I'm gone, they turn it up. Am I going to change? I better. I'm not going to purgatory and putting any heat up or down. <laughs> it's going to be there, I tell you. I, got, I should get used to this now. It's a small thing. You know, I just read something Mother Teresa said, and I think it's a very, very good thought. One of her um, companions said to her, Mother, we have a problem. And Mother Trees looked at her and she said, No, we don't have a problem. We have a gift. Oh, wow. What would happen? See, our, our purgatory on earth would kind of disappear if we felt every problem was a real gift from God. Now we come into God's holy will. Why do we go to purgatory? Because Our Lady said yes to everything, and we say no, maybe, or wait a while. Isn't that true? Huh? Say no, well, maybe I'll do it. Well, can't we wait a little bit? See, we're not prompt with our yes. I can't live with God until I really am and look at God now, we need to pray for the poor souls in purgatory. You say, why do you have to pray for them? Because your prayers relieve them. 
and add that added spark of God in their hearts so that they are purified faster and they're very grateful. I, when I used to go to Italy about every three months, um, we used to have uh, recording studios over there. And um, I heard about this church and it had in it a whole wall of various items that the, where the poor souls would come back and ask for prayers. After I saw those little samples, you know, I thought, I better pray for these people. I don't want them coming back to me. But they really asked for prayers. Nobody prays for them. I'll make a bet that if your pastor dies, you won't say a prayer for him. Why? Because you think, well, priests go straight to heaven. Nuns go straight to heaven. I would not think that way. Our dear Lord said, to whom much is given, much is required. And to whom much is given on trust, even more is required. You see? So we must pray for them. And there's that beautiful ejaculation. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord, and let perpetual light shine upon them. And may they rest in peace. It's a simple little thing. When you're there, you're going to wish somebody has praying for you. And they can pray for us. See? So now we know from the, the good catechism. In this life, it says, we can be forgiven our offenses and even all the, the, the pains of purgatory if, if, I really sincerely am sorry that I offended God. Not for fear of punishment. That's the old act of contrition. You remember that old act of contrition? But because I offend such a good God. Oh, such a good God we offend. See, for that reason, I'm sorry. That's a wonderful thing to do. And I think the poor souls, you know, there's a sentence Our Lady Fatima said, and I know some of you don't go for this kind of stuff, but since I'm here and you're there, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> uh, Our Lady said, many souls go to hell because no one prays for them. And, and you very seldom see a book that puts that in. I don't know why we have to hide all the hard things in life. They're there. I like to face them head on. Why? Because in our life, in our temptations today, you need prayer to overcome. See, a lot of people don't know they're living a bad life. Nobody tells them. And somebody asks, well, can you go to hell from purgatory? No way. No way. You know, there was a, a joke one time. And this woman's guardian angel was so, felt so bad because she went to hell. And he pleaded with God. He says, you know, I, and, and so God got kind of tired listening to him. And he said, okay. He said, tell me one good thing she did. And the guardian angel said, she gave an onion to somebody. One onion she gave. He said, yes, it was a good act, one onion. He said, okay, take that onion and go down to hell and put it down and tell her to grab it. So the angel runs and he gets this onion and he goes down to hell and he says, look, you got a chance. Here, grab it and I'll pull you up. So on her way up, all these other little demons see her coming up, see? And so they grab onto her legs and she shakes them off and she said, this is my onion. <laughs> <laughs> down she went. 
Why did I tell you that? <laughs> anyway, it showed that, you see, down there, there was no repentance, nothing. The selfishness she had was still there, and she wasn't even going to give it up. So you cannot go from hell to purgatory. Our Lord said that. You know, he said there's a great, remember when he talked about Abraham and the poor beggar? And Abraham said, Father, he says, just get some water, just a drop of water, or go tell my brothers, you know, that they don't come to this place. And the Lord said, well, I can't do that. There's a great gulf between us. And those there cannot come here. Oh, isn't that interesting, huh? Those in hell, as hard as it is to believe, want to be there. It would be more hell to be with God than it is to be where they are. Because they're full of hatred, disobedience, uh, rebellion. Rebellion. Now, what prevents us from going to purgatory? The awesome will of God. I'll tell you a little story about myself. I was a young novice. Uh, and we went to the new monastery, and it was just a, a, a house, a big house. And we pick, fixed it up, so it was kind of halfway a monastery. And, and I was at adoration, and I had a few problems, and I went to my abbess, and I told her, and she said, well, it's the will of God. Well, I had complained to her about 58 times, and every time I went, she kept saying, it is the will of God. Well, this day I was not in a mood to hear it was the will of God, you see. <laughs> so I had to get up at 11 o'clock uh, for adoration. And I went to the Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. I said, Lord, I really want to do your will. I don't mind doing your will. But I get tired of everybody telling me to do it. And I don't understand the injustice of this thing. So I find it very hard to do your will. And the Lord's infinite love and mercy, mercy on this little novice said to me, then say, it is my love for you. My thought. Oh, okay, it sounds better, but he tricked me, you see. <laughs> I found out years later, <laughs> years and years later, <laughs> that God's will and God's love was the same. They weren't different at all. And ever since then, I have thought, well, this is God's love for me. When something happens that's difficult, then I have to say God either ordains it or permits it out of love for me. It's not, it's not a punishment. It's not a chastisement. It's not an anger. Out of love, he gives me opportunities to say no to sin, to be loving or compassionate. These are all gifts from God. Maybe I don't feel like any of these gifts, but that doesn't matter. My, my, my grandmother was pure Italian. There was only one kind of medicine to grandma, Castor oil. <laughs> I'd go to any length, never to let her know I didn't feel good. 
If you had a headache, you got castor oil. If you had a stomach ache, you got castor oil. If you sneezed, you got <laughs> castor oil. <laughs> and I'd see her going to that cabinet, I knew, oh, here it comes. But I take that stuff, but I only took it because I know she loved me. She loved me. The only remedy she knew. They used to have something else called Father Brown or Father Somebody's tonic, and oh, you felt so bad after you took it <laughs> that you never knew you felt so good before you took it. <laughs> And then we had old Mamooch. You see, if you had a headache, Mamooch was called. And uh, so one night I had a terrible headache. And I said, Grandma, I, I have a bad headache. I think I'll go to bed. No, no. I said, why did I say that, Lord? I could just see that bottle coming out of that cabinet. <laughs> no, no, I'm going to call Mamooch. She walks across the street. She gets Mamooch. My mooch was a woman about, oh, maybe four feet five or six, very small, prayed constantly. So I said, oh, Grandma, what does she know? He said, shh, I call my mooch. And when Grandma said, shh, you had better shh, because you'd get it. She went over, she got my mooch, my mooch looked at me. She made a sign across on my head, patted it. Went home. I don't think uh, three, four minutes passed and my headache was gone. It was really hard for me to tell my grandma that it was gone. <laughs> but it was gone. So I finally told grandma, I told you. But see, I let her call Mamooch because I loved my grandmother very much. And even though her remedies were difficult, I knew she loved me. But well, that's the will of God, you see? We want to do something and we can't. And we get angry. We, we, we have all kinds of plans and none of them work out. We're tempted this way and that way and everywhere, in every way. But it's a call to holiness a call to holiness. And that's why our dear Lord could say to all of us, as he said in the St. John's Gospel, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Okay? And that's true of all of us. So now, let's have some calls. Hello? Hello. Where are you from? Hi, Mother Angelica. Hi. I'm calling from Providence, Rhode Island. And what is your question? Um, my question is, I have been reading um, the New Testament for quite a while now and yeah. really trying to develop a close relationship with the Lord. And I um, was wondering if you could help clear something up for me. Try. Um, I'm a little un unclear about where Jesus exactly says anything about purgatory because um, I've been really studying what he says about salvation and eternal life and all that. And the other question I have is when he, when the thief died on the cross and uh, the two thieves and, and one of them, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Yeah. And that so, was not, that was not heaven though. Oh, so that's, that's where I'm not clear because. I well, thought, well we, we don't really, yeah, we don't to, believe that that was heaven. That was a kind of limbo, but that thief had his purgatory on the cross. First of all, he acknowledged that Jesus was Son of God. He called him Lord. Secondly, he knew he was a king. And he said, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And he was awesomely repentant. Now, heaven was opened for all the saints in limbo or wherever they were on Ascension Day. Our dear Lord brought his victorious resurrection and all those in him to heaven. 
So we got, that's what the holy, the, the, what he was, Dismas. He realized that this was the Son of God. He had the power to put him in heaven, to forgive him. And, and I really feel Our Lady prayed for that, that our Lord would have that consolation. The people beneath him hated him. For all of his three years of labor, he had his mother, a poor sinner, repentant sinner, and John. All the rest had left him. And I really feel Our Lady prayed for those two thieves. One cursed him, the other said, Lord. His purgatory must have been a long one. Because what they did, you know, they would break their legs. Why? So they could no longer lift themselves up to breathe. And if they broke your legs, your body hung in a very short time, you died. Oh, he had a real awesome purgatory. Now, you find in Mark 9, 48, and 1 Corinthians 3, 14, and Luke and Matthew 12, 32, I'm going to get uh, Mark 9, 48. Okay, here we go. 9, 48. Mm -hmm. Here. For everyone will be salted with fire. Hmm. Salted with fire. Salt is a good thing. But if the salt becomes insipid, how can you season with it? Be at peace with one another. Now I want to give you St. Luke's Gospel. Because this is something, I heard it not too long ago. And I hope I can find it. Okay, come on. Okay, here, Luke, uh, what is it, 12th chapter, 47th verse. I want, you to read, I want you to hear this now. The servant who knows what his master wants, but does, has not even started to carry out those wishes. You got somebody like that? Have you ever done that? Huh? Your mother tells you to do something, you haven't even begun. We'll receive very, very many strokes of the lash. Mm. The one who did not know, I hear this is going to gripe you good, but deserved to be beaten for what he's done, will receive fewer strokes. Hey. What do you think these strokes are? Somebody's going to come out of nowhere and whip you up a little bit? No, we're talking about a little purgatory here. Now, when a man has a great deal given him, a great deal will be demanded. That's fair. Here's where priests and religious and bishops and cardinals and all the rest of them come in. And when a man has had a great deal given him on trust, more than he needs for himself, even more will be expected of him. That's kind of um, strong. There's one more here I wanted to show you. Corinthians 3. Um, there you go. 3. Did I say 3? Yeah, 314. Okay. Okay, 314, that day, what are we talking about? We're talking about death, and that day of, the, of, of judgment. That day will begin with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. So that, that's that purgatory in our life. Our life is full of pains and aches and sadness and disappointment. And if we accept them as coming permitted or ordained by God, that's our purgatory. Now, if his structure stands up to it, 
he gets his wages. You get eternal life. So you've gone through all your, your troubles, with, and, and you, you said, Lord, it is you. If it is burned down, he will be the loser. Now we're talking about hell. And though he has saved himself, his purgatory, there's another one here, it will be as one who has gone through fire. So we have a little example here in Corinthians. This is not what our Lord said, but Corinthians. And St. Paul says, on this foundation, that's the foundation of our life, where whatever the material, the work of each one of us. Now, what kind of work? Okay, on this foundation, you can build in gold, silver, jewels, wood, grass, and straw, which means your whole life has become kaput. This is St. Paul, inspired by the Spirit. What he says, your life, what are you doing? You're, you're, you're sending up wood, jewels, silver, gold, or straw. Okay? And St. Paul is very strong that you're going to be the loser. This is purgatory that you could, you saved. In purgatory, they're all saved. But you'll be as one who has gone through fire. See? I hope that answers your question. Hello? Yes, hi, Mother. This is Susan in Chicago. And what is your question? Well, I want to say to you, I'm glad you like the roses because I sent them to you. Oh, you're the one. I'm the one. It's well, another Italian thank mother. Thank you. You're they welcome. Are, listen, they're beautiful. They're this big already. I'm glad you put them in front of Jesus because I told well, I them did. to give you a call. I was afraid of those souls in purgatory <laughs> get after me. I have a comment and I have a question. Okay. I just want to add to uh, what you were talking about in terms of praying for the Holy Souls and how we could help release them from right. purgatory. And um, from my readings, the Mass is the most efficacious yeah. form of relieving the souls from purgatory. Right. And if we can't get many Masses offered, we can assist at as many Masses as possible. Right. Also, the Rosary and the Stations are very richly indulgent. Um, the Gertrude Prayer, the Chaplet of Mercy, Fasting, Psalm 129, and the Heroic Act of Charity. Right. My question is, is how can we avoid purgatory? And we thank you from the bottom of our heart in Chicago and along the East Coast for, for, um, for responding for the Holy Soul. And thank for the roses. Um, the best way, and, and I don't think it's very hard. I really don't. Our Lord does not ordain we all go to purgatory. We can avoid purgatory by just accepting the will of God and allowing the will of God to be our joy. Okay. When our dear Lord said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me, just imagine what that means. What does food do for you? Well, makes you feel good, gives you more strength, makes you happy, builds up your body, your muscles, your blood, everything. If you didn't eat, you'd just shrivel up. Well, the will of God is like that in our soul. It builds us up. It makes us more, look more like Jesus. It purifies us from all our sinner conditions from all the consequences of our sin. You say, what are consequences? All right, if you drink a half a pint or a whole pint of whiskey, the next day you call it a hangover. Well, those are consequences, see? If you had, you know, we used to have, I told you my grandfather had a saloon. And this man we used to call number nine because he wore big, he had big feet when he was about eight years old and they, they, we, we named him number nine because his feet were that big, you know. Well, when he'd get drunk, the next day he was in bed all day with a hangover. And finally his mother would take him and dump him in cold water. Now here's a man who did something wrong he paid for it. Those are consequences. And his mother dumped him. 
in that cold water. So here it is purgatory. Whenever we do anything that harms our body or our soul, we have those consequences after and before. I have a tendency to be impatient. I'm 72 and I still have a tendency to be impatient. But I have to overcome that. I have to try. So it's like Adam and Eve, you know, they never felt anger. They never felt jealousy. They never felt rebellion. And now they began to feel it and we feel it. You find some children that tall, one is generous, one selfish. Two kids came with their mother one day and they were eating this all day sucker. I mean, these big things, you know. And they were wet and they were, <laughs> and I said, oh, wow. One came in, saw me, he said, you want a lick? I said, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so I gave it a big lick. When the other kid saw me do that, he put his behind his back. <laughs> He wasn't going to share anything. And I was just about that tall. There was a consequence. You see, we just not born the immaculate conception. Those kind of things we have to understand. We can overcome. What? With the Mass? With confession. Confession. And the Eucharist. If we were sorry every night for our failings, if we went to confession more often, confession, if we were more repentant of our sins, and if we loved God to accept His will lovingly, your purgatory would be either non-existent or very short. We have another call. Hello? Hi. <laughs> yoo -hoo. I had a question for you. I Good. know um, I was discussing with a friend of mine the subject of purgatory the other night, and uh, he's a, a, a Christian, uh, a Catholic, and um, he was in disagreement with me about uh, the subject of purgatory. He did not believe in purgatory, and I felt that he really had to believe in that if he was to, to call himself a Catholic, which you also alluded to earlier this evening that really you have to believe in purgatory as well, a it's Catholic. A, it's a doctrine in the church. It's part of the magisterium. That's right. And, and uh, this was part of our discussion. And we were talking about the need for a, a Savior. And um, he was talking about Mary. He did not believe that Mary was, in, was born in a sinless state because in the Magnificat in Luke, uh, she says, my soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Right. And um, I'm wondering if you might be able to address that as far as her need for a Savior if she was born in a sinless state where only sinners are in need of a Savior, as you did no. mention at the beginning of your program. No. Our Lady was also saved, but not from sin. She was immaculately conceived, and she never committed a sin. But all the prerogatives she had, see, were in view of this redemption Jesus gave us on the cross. And for example, her very immaculate conception was paid for by Jesus on the cross. See, every, uh, every prerogative of Our Lady, her sinlessness, her awesome holiness, and the angel is the one who says, Hail, full of grace. What does that mean? Hail, Mary, full of God. If she had original sin, she would not be full of God. The angel would have lied. But he didn't say that. He said, Hail, full of grace. So we know from Scripture that she was immaculately conceived. Even that was paid for by Jesus on the cross. Every attribute she has, everything, virgin and mother. She never, never, all these people say she had other children. Why you say that? It's the dumbest thing I ever heard. 
Why are you jealous of the generosity of God who put aside for his mother one who never had the shadow, even the shadow of the enemy on her soul? It would be an abomination for God to come into a temple that had a shadow of sin or a shadow of original sin. Oh, yeah, we're all sinners. We start with original sin. I know some of you liberals say there's no original sin. Well, you're wrong. There is. That's why you need baptism. And baptize your babies. You don't know how long they're going to live. I almost walked to the baptismal fount, waiting for my Kumbari to come back from Italy. Don't do that. Allow your baby to be free of sin as fast as possible. We all need a Savior. In this day and age, you need him even more than you did before. Because today, everything goes. Everything goes. You, you see pictures and you, you look at billboards and you, you just want to hide yourself because there is, we, we have become so attuned to evil and lusts and drinking and drugs, everything that we're, we're no longer at that point where we sense any sin. We don't sense it anymore. And so there is a purgatory. Listening to me an hour may be part of your purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> but I can assure you that talking to you is a part of my heaven. God bless you. Ha, ha, ha.